Hello, I'm Herman Everhart, the Supervisory Museum Curator here at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. Every year we organize new special exhibits in the museum that provide our visitors with fresh, in-depth perspectives on topics related to the lives and public careers of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Our current special exhibit, Black Americans, Civil Rights, and the Roosevelts, opened in June and will be on display through December 2024. Often during the process of researching and designing new exhibits, we discover unexpected things that surprise us and end up enriching the exhibit in ways we hadn't anticipated. And in this program, I'm going to talk about one of those research surprises. Back in 2017, the museum organized a major exhibit to mark the 75th anniversary of one of FDR's landmark decisions, a decision that is roundly criticized today by historians and the public. The exhibit was titled, Images of Internment, the Incarceration of Japanese Americans During World War II. And it took a critical look at FDR's Executive Order 9066, which he issued in February 1942. That order led to the incarceration of over 100,000 people of Japanese descent in government camps that were constructed in remote areas of several Western states. My research for the exhibit took me to the National Archives facility in College Park, Maryland, where I examined a well-known collection of thousands of photographs shot by government photographers that are part of the records of the War Relocation Authority. That was the government agency in charge of operating the camps. And the photographs shot by its photographers document this shameful chapter in our nation's history in great detail. We displayed hundreds of the War Relocation Authority photographs in our exhibit to provide visitors with a detailed visual record of this great injustice. But while researching those photographs at the National Archives, I came across references to a smaller, lesser known collection of photographs that also documented the Japanese American incarceration story. These lesser known photographs, which are preserved at the Library of Congress, were not taken by a photographer employed by the government, they were shot by a private citizen, and not just any private citizen. This was a fabled photographer who is widely remembered today for his iconic photographs of Western American landscapes and natural settings. The photographer was Ansel Adams, the renowned landscape photographer, environmentalist, and key figure in the early history of the Sierra Club. We remember Adams today for his dramatic landscape photographs like these iconic images. He is not someone you would expect at first glance to be involved with documentary photography on a topic like the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And in fact, the story of why and how Adams came to photograph Japanese Americans imprisoned by the government is a fascinating tale in and of itself. In this program, we will explore that story and see many of the photographs Adams took. But before we do that, we need to understand the bigger story of FDR's Executive Order 9066. That story begins on December 7, 1941, when Japan attacked American military installations at Pearl Harbor, abruptly thrusting the United States into World War II. In the aftermath of the Pearl Harbor attack, rumors and fears regarding the possibility of Japanese air raids, acts of sabotage, or even invasion engulfed America's west coast. These fears, which bordered on panic, led many members of the public, along with the media and politicians, to question the loyalty of the large Japanese American population living in the states of California, Washington, and Oregon. They were said to be involved in spying and acts of sabotage. These attitudes were fed by long-standing racial prejudices against Asian Americans that had existed for decades on the West Coast. Within weeks of the Pearl Harbor attack, a chorus of West Coast politicians, along with newspaper editors and military leaders, began demanding that the federal government remove all Japanese Americans from the region as a military precaution. Though no evidence of disloyalty by these people was ever presented, President Roosevelt gave in to the political and military pressure. On February 19, 1942, he signed Executive Order 9066. That executive order led to the forced removal of all people of Japanese descent from the entire state of California and large portions of Washington State, Oregon, and Arizona. You can see the areas where people were removed shaded in black on this map. 
Over 100,000 people were abruptly taken from their homes, jobs, and businesses, and transported to 10 government camps that were quickly constructed in the interior. Two-thirds of these people were American citizens. Here you see people lining up under military guard to be taken by train from the West Coast to one of the camps. And here is an aerial view of one of the camps. These were military installations guarded by armed troops and ringed with barbed wire. And remember, the people confined there were held without ever being charged with any offense. They were there strictly because they were of Japanese descent and lived on the West Coast. So now that you have some background on the story of Japanese Americans and internment, we can turn to the unusual story of how Ansel Adams became involved with this tragic event. Adams was a native Californian and lived in the San Francisco area. Consequently, he observed firsthand the forced removal of Japanese Americans from their homes during the spring and early summer of 1942. He was deeply disturbed by what he saw. He also had a personal connection to the removals. Harry Oi, a first-generation Japanese American who had been a longtime employee of Adams' parents, was taken away to a government camp in Missouri, despite the fact that he was in very ill health. Adams was moved to do something to help ease the plight of the people held in the camps, people he felt were loyal Americans who had been victimized because of racial animosity and prejudice. Now, by chance, he was friends with a fellow member of the Sierra Club, a man named Ralph Merritt, who happened to be the director of one of the 10 government camps operated by the War Relocation Authority. Merritt was in charge of the Manzanar Relocation Center in Southern California. You can see that camp's location on the left side of this map depicting the 10 government camps. Manzanar was located in the Owens Valley in Southern California in the shadow of the Sierra Nevada mountains that Adams had photographed for many years. Approximately 10,000 Japanese Americans, most originally from the Los Angeles area, were held at Manzanar during World War II. In 1943, Adams received permission from his friend Ralph Merritt to enter the Manzanar camp and photograph its residents. The only restrictions Merritt put on Adams was that he could not photograph the guard towers or the barbed wire fences that ringed the camp. So what exactly was Adams hoping to do when he got permission to photograph at Manzanar? Well, his intent was to publish a book of his photographs and mount a photographic exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, where he served as vice chair of the photography department. His plan was for both the exhibit and the book to present a record of the lives of the people confined in the camp and make the argument that these were loyal, hardworking Americans. As he put it in a letter to Nancy Newhall, wife of Beaumont Newhall, curator of photography at MoMA, quote, through the pictures, the viewer will be introduced to loyal American citizens who are anxious to get back into the stream of life and contribute to our victory, end quote. Now, at first glance, it seems rather odd that the government would allow a prominent private photographer into one of the internment camps. But on closer examination, there are two important reasons that help us understand why Ralph Merritt was open to this idea. First, Merritt and some other individuals within the War Relocation Authority had a conflicted view about what they were doing. They were genuinely torn in their views of the people they were charged with keeping inside the camps believing that the vast majority of those held there were loyal citizens. Second, and more importantly, by 1943, it had become the policy of the War Relocation Authority to begin releasing people who were deemed to be loyal from the camps as long as they could be relocated to areas outside the West Coast. So, for example, by 1943, you have college students leaving the camps to attend universities in the East and Midwest. Other individuals were released to take jobs in defense factories outside the West Coast. Merritt and others within the War Relocation Authority likely assumed that Adams' photographs, in both book form and in the MoMA exhibit, would help to present Japanese Americans in a positive light and hopefully make it easier for those who were leaving the camps to, to transition smoothly into communities in the Midwest and East. So with Merritt's approval, Adams made four visits to the Manzanar camp during the fall of 1943. 
During these visits, he talked extensively with the people confined there and shot more than 200 photographs. Some of these photographs are done in his signature style of landscape photography. Here, for instance, we see a familiar Adams view of mountains in the background, but the foreground reveals not a scene of natural beauty, but a scene of human confinement. A similar effect is present in this photograph with its broad view of sky and mountains above a scene of drab, flimsy camp housing units. The sky and wide expanse of treeless landscape in this photo underscores the remote and Spartan nature of the camp where these high school students must live and study. This image depicts people working on the camp's farm. Manzanar was a largely self-sufficient camp. Japanese Americans performed most of the labor, including farming. Indeed, the theme of industry, hard work, and self-sufficiency is one that shows up in many of Adams' photographs. Here, for example, we see a farmer feeding chickens. And here, Adams shows us employees of a cooperative store operated by people in the camp. Here, camp workers are shown repairing a phone line. And here, we have a nurse in the camp hospital. Manzanar, like all the camps, operated like a small city of 10,000 people with all of the basic infrastructure, including a hospital, that was needed to maintain it. Again, almost all of the labor was performed by the people confined in the camps. In addition to, to depicting people at work, Adams shows us other aspects of life in the camps, seeking to underscore that the people living there were just like other Americans. So we have scenes like these of religious life. Here are students in a Sunday school class. There are also photographs of students in the camp's high school, and recreational scenes like this volleyball game, and a baseball game. You can't get any more American than that. He shows us the editors of the camp's newspaper. There's even this image of a town hall meeting. In all these shots, you can see Adams attempting to show Japanese Americans doing things that other ordinary American citizens do. The message is clear. These are people just like you and me. So he includes family scenes like this one, and photos of people shopping in the camp co-op store. Now, all of the shots I've shown to this point are an important part of the story that Adams was trying to frame for his audience. But they are only a minority of the photos he took at Manzanar. The vast majority were done in a format we don't normally associate with him. And that format is portrait photography of individual people. These are respectful portraits. The subjects look directly at the viewer. Their faces fill the frame. Most are shot from slightly below, so the camera is looking up at the person from a slight angle. This gives them an almost monumental quality. Many of the people depicted are identified by their profession. So for example, we see a policeman and these two electricians. These portrait photographs, interspersed with the occupational and recreational photos I showed earlier, along with uh, far broader scenes of the camps, form the heart of Adam's photographic essay on Manzanar. He is making us come face to face with the people who have been confined in the camp. People just like the viewer, loyal Americans. Now after he wrapped up his photography work, Adams put together an exhibit. He displayed the show for the first time in January 1944 at the Manzanar camp. Later that year, in November 1944, he mounted the show at New York City's Museum of Modern Art. He also published this book, which he titled Born Free and Equal, The Story of Loyal Japanese Americans. The book intersperses photographs with text written by Adams that describes the lives of the people confined at Manzanar. There is a remarkable forward to the book that was written by Secretary of the Interior Harold Eckes, a member of FDR's cabinet, who was also a sharp critic of the internment policy. And I just want to quote a bit from Ickes forward because it is a remarkable statement coming from a member of the Roosevelt administration in the middle of World War II. Ickes writes, quote, it has long been my belief that the greatness of America has arisen in large part out of the diversity of her peoples. Before the war, people of Japanese ancestry were a small but valuable element in our population. Then war came with the nation of their parental origin. The ensuing two and a half years have brought heartaches to many in our population. 
among the casualties of war has been America's Japanese minority. It is my prayer that other Americans will fully realize that to condone the whittling away of the rights of any one minority group is to pave the way for all of us to lose the guarantees of the Constitution. As the President has said, Americanism is a matter of the mind and heart. Americanism is not and never was a matter of race or ancestry. That truth is eloquently illustrated by the photographs on the following pages." End quote. Well, equally remarkable is what follows Ickes' introduction. On this page, Adams presents the 14th Amendment of the Constitution alongside a quote from Abraham Lincoln that reads, as a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to this, I shall prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy." End quote. Well, after that bracing introduction, the book unveils its photographs. There is landscape photography that depicts the harsh but beautiful environment of the camp. And then there are the portraits with captions written by Adams that underscore his theme. This one is titled, An American Schoolgirl. The caption for this one reads, is her future only a hope and not an assurance? On and on it goes in that manner. Often Adams notes an individual's profession. Here we encounter a rubber chemist here, an accountant and businessman, a tractor and diesel expert, a divinity student. These are Americans like you and me, he is saying, over and over. They go to church. They work. They raise families. Some are serving their country overseas. The captions for these two photographs read, one son of the Yanomutso family is in the US Army. Another son is an x-ray technician in the Manzanar Hospital. This theme of military service is one that Adams plays up in the portrait photos. As some of you may know, the government recruited soldiers from the camps to serve overseas. This led to the cruel irony of men serving and in some cases dying in battle for their country while their parents and siblings were imprisoned at home. I think the overall theme of Adams' book is best represented in the words he uses to caption several specific photographs that I will highlight here. Here he presents us with a portrait of a young woman with the caption, Americanism is a matter of the mind and heart. Then there is this photo of high school students on their way to school. Its caption reads, Manzanar is only a detour on the road of American citizenship. This photo of a farm worker has a caption filled with irony, quote, our president has said that every loyal American citizen, regardless of his ancestry, should be given the opportunity to serve his country wherever his skills will make the greatest contribution, whether it be by industry or agriculture." End quote. Then there is this portrait, the last portrait photo featured in the book. It has no caption. It is left for the reader to fill in. And finally, there is the book's final photograph, here, Adams decided to present what has become one of his most famous landscape photographs. I am showing it here with its usual caption, the one typically accompanying the photo when it appears in books or photographic ex exhibitions. That caption reads, Winter Sunrise, the Sierra Nevada from Lone Pine, California, 1944. What few people know is that Adams shot that photo while he was working at the Manzanar camp. And in his book, Adams presents the photo with a radically different caption, one you won't see when the photo is presented in modern books and exhibits. The caption reads, quote, in the presence of the ancient mountains, the people of Manzanar await their destiny, end quote. Adams' hope was that their destiny would be a reintegration into American society. It's not clear how much impact Adams' book or the exhibit he staged at the Museum of Modern Art had in 1944. We know that he was disappointed with the book's sales and circulation, but he believed that the work he did at Manzanar was one of the most important experiences of his photographic career. And certainly today, this book and the powerful photographs in it 
continues to bear eloquent witness to the character and endurance of the over 100,000 Japanese Americans who were treated so unjustly during World War II.